And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. God's signs. Let's talk about God's signs for a moment and uh, see what we can ascertain. For He gives us many. But there's one specific group of signs that He has set before us whereby we, do, we need not lack knowledge concerning what tomorrow brings, what you should look for in your personal life, how you find peace of mind, and how you become successful. Of course, successful can mean many things to many people. In my opinion, as long as you have peace of mind and you utilize that, you are successful. Regardless of what state, level, life as man might judge. Because peace of mind is such a precious thing. It comes from only one place, and that's our Heavenly Father. I like to think many times about the millennium. I like to think, what's going to happen there? What kind of signs have we been given, or as some people would say, heaven? And Jesus even told us this in Luke chapter 16. I'm going to take it from a little different approach, but I want you to turn there with me if you would. Luke chapter 16, God's signs. Lazarus and the rich man have been there in this, they're in heaven. There is a gulf between them because the rich man didn't make the grade. But Lazarus, which is the equivalent of the Hebrew word Eleazar, which was the priesthood, was resurrected. That's what Christ was telling us within this. But I want you to think for a moment, if you would, about the rich man that didn't make it yet, anyway. Who knows what the millennium brings? But um, the, his thoughts, and as you all have been turning there, I want to pick it up, if I may in verse 27 of that 16th chapter, and let's see what the rich man states. 27th verse, 16th chapter, book of Luke. And it reads, Then he said, this is the rich man talking to Abraham and to the Father, Christ's parable concerning two actual people. I pray thee therefore, when he was not given the living water, which he requested, he had a change of heart. He began to think about somebody besides himself. Listen to this. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Now this is really unusual. He's thinking about someone else. What a change of heart, huh? It lets you know what the presence of God can bring. 28, for I have five brethren that he may testify, I want you to make a mental note of that word testify and testimony unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now, don't think of this as fire as some people do. The torment was the fact he didn't make it. He could see the glorious happiness of those that did overcome. He didn't make it and that in itself is torment, all right? Go tell them. And I think it's remarkable, five being grace, that he would think of someone other than himself at this late stage. 29, Abraham, uh, Abraham means what? Father of all nations or many nations. So he is the fog, father figure in this, speaking for our heavenly father. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses... And the prophets, let them hear them. Now there's a great clue as to God's signs. They're in, the, they're in Moses and they're in the prophets. In other words, that's all you're going to get. Verse 30, and he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. 31, and he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, that's important, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, 
though one rose from the dead. And of course, Christ himself would not long after this parable was given, and they would not believe him either. But Moses and the prophets you have. I want you to see our Father's mind within this, and I hope within it it can build a stronger trust, love, and personal faith relationship with Him. I want you to see how sure of Himself He is, for He can afford to be. Let's take Moses as an example. All of our other people are in captivity, and Pharaoh has them. They're making bricks and what have you. And they are multiplying so fast. It seems our people have a way of doing that. Multiply so fast that the Egyptians were beginning to be a little bit concerned here, you know, that they're going to overpopulate us. Let's kill off all the babes. And their little Moses was in that group. Now think about that. Has father gone out on a limb? Think about something else. The mother, being warned, placed the babe in a basket, a little ark, if you would, and puts him in the Nile. Hey, there's crocs out there. Now, I mean, here, Moses, it depends on him to deliver the people. What are our chances? We got a baby? in a basket, in a river full of crocodiles, and he's floating right down to the enemy's headquarters, Pharaoh. Now just think about that a moment. Your salvation or your chances of salvation kind of hung on that. Was this type of deliverer savior? What are our chances? A (laughs) crocodile. A babe in an ark in a river full of crocodiles. It don't look good, does it? Well, sometimes when you look at life without the blessings of God and without His signs, it don't look so good, does it? Doesn't look good out there. But we haven't got a thing in the world to worry about. Because he had an elder sister, Miriam. God touched the mother and said, Miriam, you go down those reeds, you watch and you observe. And believe it or not, that little baby washed right up into Pharaoh's camp. And his order is, kill him. Here's the Savior, this type of Savior, the sign you're going to get. And instantly the love in Pharaoh's sister heart went out to that little one. And she took him as her own. He was was raised and educated at the expense of the enemy. He was loved by the enemy. He worked himself right into their hearts. Do you think God was worried for his sake for one moment? Of course not. So sometimes you have to look where the rubber hits the road. That was just a Probably uh, an innocent baby is probably one of the least able uh, creatures. I'll use that terminology to protect itself. Aside from a lamb that there is. I mean, if they don't have help, they'll die. But God wasn't worried. Do you know something? No more than He's worried about you today in all your troubles. I don't care. You can put all your troubles together, and I don't think you would have as many troubles as that little baby in that basket in a river full of crocodiles. I don't think yours would sum up to that with that much depending on it. The type. Savior, the deliverer of Israel. And he grew. And he grew strong. And he was high ranking in the kingdom. Had he not chosen as God would instruct him to deliver his people, probably 
he would have been the one that would have been Pharaoh ultimately because Pharaoh truly loved him, a Pharaoh at least, to say the least. But we know that God had a plan for him. At 40 years old, he took him. What's 40? Probation. In a sense, we were on probation in that time. Your faith was tested that 40 years. And Ramesses takes him to the edge of a desert that man cannot cross without aid, water, and so forth, and gives him a staff only and scoots him out into the sand. But he had an overseer. I hope you do today. That overseer was our father. And you know something? He's just not worried. He doesn't care what the odds are. Why do you? You know, many times if you stick by his plan, you are ridiculed. Little troubles here and little troubles there. I don't have time to worry about them. Fix them if they need it and go on. God is going to take care of you if... You do it His way. That's the secret. Doing it His way. Well, how do I do that? You got Moses and the prophets. They tell you. They teach you. So, Moses makes it through the desert. Impossible for man, but not for God. Nothing is impossible with our Father. If He says it, let me tell you something, friend. That's the way it's going to be. No ifs, ands, buts, or maybes. That is the way it's going to be. So Moses wanders into this camp. He gets acquainted with the Kenites right off because Jethro, who was of Medan, being a son of Abraham by Keturah, his second wife, has moved over and is grazing sheep in the Kenite country. And they were kind of mean to him, drove him away from the water and so forth. And Moses went in and busted heads. Said, the girls will water first. And he made an impression, I'm sure, upon them. And they probably walked a pretty wide, gave him a wide berth after that point. But 40 more years he stays with Jethro and raises a family. And you all know the story, and the story's not that important. The important thing is that you see what his chances were if you were to look at it with a human mind. What were his chances? Go back to the river. I, you know, as a human being, I wouldn't have given him. If I didn't know the facts, I'd say, that baby is a goner. But we know the facts, and you should know the facts today. We don't have anything to worry about. Yeah, there's going to be problems, but hey, bring them on. Because we're can-do type people with God's help. We, we, if God wouldn't let anything happen to that baby, do you think He's going to let something happen to you that kind of wasn't in His plan if you're doing it by, the prof, by Moses and the prophets? Of course not. It's a cinch. It's set in concrete because it's set in our Father's Word. If you participate in that Moses being the law and testify the testimony I ask you to make a mental note of, you've got it. You learn. You grow. You're used of God, and He knows. So where is your faith? I would say to you that the next time you feel like the crocodiles are nipping at you, stop and think a minute, all right? You've got someone that's an expert in kicking crocodiles, all right? Taking names and kicking dragon, all right? I mean, we've got, we've got it made, quite frankly. And when you look at the report that he left for us, it's a pleasure to serve him and watch the enemy sweat. Well, the enemy's getting bigger and bigger. So what? That makes them our equal, a good opponent. We'll rattle their chain. Why? Because it's God that does it. 
we have nothing to be afraid of as long as we use common sense and are careful. So, what does Moses do then? It's time for him to repay just a little bit. I mean, a little babe was taken care of by the chief shepherd. Now he is a shepherd. And God takes him up that great mountain and he speaks to him. And he wants his people to have what? What Moses was supposed to give you. The law. The word. And he gave him that and he sent him back down that mountain. And soon he told him, Moses, you will go to Pharaoh and you will free your people. Now, I want you to put yourself in that position. This would be like me, not like, it wouldn't be like this. I just want to give, I'm trying to think of an analogy. It would be like someone would walk up to you and say, I want you to go to, to uh, Bosnia. And I want you to tell those Bosnians to get their act together and get along and bring our people home. What? <laughs> you know? See, I mean, that's about how it would have been, only maybe even more so because Ramesses already told him, I'll kill you if you come back. No army, a few sheep, you know, a staff, and a brother. And God says, go get my people. I mean, that's, that's a pretty tall order. But I don't want you to overlook the significance of it. You and God make a majority. You can do it if it's His will when He uses you. Don't be afraid of the dark. Who is the dark? It's Satan. You don't have to be afraid of him. He should run from you because of the Christ that is in you. So, here goes Moses, always loyal, and you should be too. And he walks right up, tells them, miracles are performed, God is in control, and Moses delivers the people through God's help, direction, and they come into the promised land. Many things happening that are all very important. I'm just what comes to my mind is the rock, okay? The rock that gave them the water of what Moses did in disregard, in, in a moment, made a mistake. We all do. And God kind of punished him for it. In a way, I still have my doubts. For only God buried Moses, and I think he buried him the same way he did Elijah, if you want. I mean, that's just my opinion. Don't ask me to document that. Um... And that's, you know, for a student of the Word, that's not hard. To, it's not very difficult to come to that conclusion. But Moses' entire life was a sign to you. Because you see, the main sign there is, is God's people. The people God used. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Elijah, Moses. All of God's children are a sign. And even in this generation, your sign is the movement God allows His people to progress in. Let me say that a little different way. You can judge God's people by the success He allows them in building a force against the enemy. That's a sign. But one of the most important things is this. Well, I, I don't quite understand that. It's just like you would take a child and build an analogy through using visual aids to make it very simple for them. As, as um, Phyllis does in the children's book. Give visual aid along with the truth. Make it simple. It tells a little story. It gets it said. And that's what God is doing to you. He's saying, listen, little children... This is how it is going to be. Let's take Moses, all right? And look what he accomplished with no one's help but mine. Hey, it was a lot, okay? He got it done. So what are you fretting about? 
Well, I'd just like to do something for the Lord. Well, get into His Word. Plant seeds. And don't worry. When the false Messiah appears, that is our time. That's when we really go into action. By that I mean the Spirit through us. Hey, we'll be able to do anything. By that I mean what we speak is not what we speak, but what the Holy Spirit speaks. You can't go wrong on that. It's not like some pastor that's got to, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, deliver a sermon and work at it and work at it and work at it and say, what, what would God have me bring forth today and really want it to be in God's will to strengthen the people, fortify them. It'll just be there. You won't have to worry as it's written in Luke 21. Even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say. So, don't get bored with serving God. The action hasn't even started. But it's about to. I really believe that. So you see, he gave us Moses. He says, that's all you're going to get. You don't need much more. But then what about the prophets? And for the sake of time, we'll only take one prophet. The chief prophet, Elijah, the one that appeared with Moses to Christ, with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. Elijah, at one time, hey, and as it is written in the New Testament, he wasn't any different than we are. Elijah was just a man, all right? Elijah the Tishbet, just a man. Everything was common to him, but he had something. He had faith to trust God's Word, to know if it was written it wasn't difficult to prophesy it because if it's written, that's the way it's going to be, honey. No doubts. No problems. So he set forth, but you know what? It came to a point where he was the only one seemingly to him left. Have you ever felt that way? Nobody else believes the way I do. My whole family kind of stands against me and I try to talk to somebody and nobody will listen. Well, Elijah was the same way. He even complained to God at one time. He said, There's, I'm all alone. They've, everybody has left but me. Why don't you just kill me and get it over with? I just, I'm out of food. I'm just going to lay down here and die. Now, that's what Elijah said by a little old juniper tree. And God kind of Straightened him around, sent the, in the Hebrew tongue, the Arab to teach him, feed him, and help him. Raven in English, if you prefer. And he um, began to pick him up. And then he gave him a little assurance. And there come the day that Elijah, the prophet, and all the Baal preachers of the time, one against many. So I mean, like if my memory doesn't fail me, it was a number, something like 400, Earth's number. And Elijah backs off and he says, tell you what we're going to do, we'll make a deal. You know, we'll build an altar here. We'll put a sacrifice on it. And you pray to your gods to consume the sacrifice with fire. And Elijah goes back over in the shade and sits down and waits. And the 400 false prophets, do you all know what a false prophet is? That's a false preacher. That's a preacher or a teacher that does not teach God's Word, that has dreams and, I saw a great light. And I believe that God has changed His mind. And he wants me to rewrite the Bible for him. Now, would you listen to a man like that? I would hope not. I really would hope not. Dreamers. But they're out there. And, and um, like I always call them, they're a bunch of squirrels looking for nuts. Don't be a nut, all right? Stick with your Father's Word, and when I say stick, I mean stick because that's where your power is. That's where your strength comes from. That's where your faith enables you. 
That's why you can be so sure of yourself that there's not a doubt. I still believe there's no such thing as half believing. If you half believe, you're not a believer. Get out of my sight. You know, by that I mean don't, don't try, to, don't try to, uh, to snow an old snower. All right? Uh, it can't be done. Not too easy. You either believe or you don't. There's no such thing as believing halfway or partway or almost. If there's still doubt, I'm sorry. You're never going to make it in that category of knowing that when God says it, it's so. And that's how it will come to pass. Excuse me for being so strong on that point, but that's the difference in knowing that God makes a difference and He's looking for real people, not halfways. Anyway, let's look at the halfways. 400 of them out here. I've got religion. Uh, we're going to get our gods to burn this stack of meat. 400 of us and one of Him. Oh, our gods. Come down and burn this stack of meat. And Elijah, he's over there because he knows, you know, there's only one God. They can hoop, dream, shout, lie, anything they want to, and nothing is going to happen to that meat as long as you keep the birds shoot off of it, all right? It ain't going to happen because there is only one God. Now, there's kind of a prince of the air. But we're smarter than he is. Why? Because of Moses and the prophets. So they begin, they get really, really, we're going to have a revival. All 400 of us have a revival right here around the stump. And we're going to call down fire from heaven on high. Doesn't that sound religious? It really does, doesn't it? Elijah begins to, I, I love it. I love what he did to him. I could almost see myself doing that. Maybe it's a holiday for your gods. <laughs> yeah, and he waits along, and about an hour goes by, and he says, Maybe, I'll just put this in plain English from the Hebrew, maybe he's going to the bathroom. <laughs> and they continue to hold their revival. You know, and on and on it goes, and pretty soon they begin to cut themselves and whip themselves, and they're really building up a lava, all right? They still haven't got any gods. It's real simple because there's only one. And then Elijah tells them, dig a trench, pour on water. He's really going to, you know, show them hey, it was dry while you were working with it. Pour on water, more water, and whoom, God consumed that sacrifice. Why? Elijah was God's man. Why? He stuck with God rather than soothsayers. He stuck with God's word because it was written important. Elijah was not, he was, he was not supernatural. Again, the New Testament draws this point out. He's just like you. There was just one difference. He knew the Word. And he claimed the Word. And he believed the Word. And naturally, God used him and touched him and worked with him. Why? Because he was doing God's work. The only way that God will work with you is if you are doing God's work. Well, well, well how do I know? Moses and the prophets. That's what G he made that point. I mean, it was, it was life this side or that side. Don't do any good to send you. Why? Because Moses and the prophets even foretold of the coming of Yeshua, Messiah, of Christ. You can't really believe some man saying, I'm Jesus, if the prophets and Moses didn't foretell of His coming. It would make it very difficult. But God said it. The virgin conceived, 
And it happened. Why? Moses and the prophets foretold us it's the seedbed of knowledge, of wisdom, of understanding, that you can trust God enough. Hey, Elijah was putting it all on the line. Here he is, one against 400 religious people, and he won because God was with him. That if God isn't on your side, friend, I'm sorry, you got trouble. You really got trouble. You need to pray about it. You need to get into the Word, the real Word, not man's Word, not traditions, not what this person said, this person or any other person, into the Word. There was another time that 50 men went out to get Elijah, troopers, I mean heavy trained soldiers, and Elijah's sitting up kind of on a place, and they told him to come down, and he says, Psh! boom, God killed 50 of them, just boom. And boy, here, um ba dum ba dum ba dum ba -dum. 50 more coming, real troop. Elijah, come down from there. And here comes 50 more. Elijah, are you up there? My friend, <laughs> don't go psh. talk to me. So he asked, would you please? Don't, don't, you know, it's not my fault I'm asking this. You know, so they worked things out, okay? But was Elijah afraid? of 50, of 400, or whatever. No, it didn't matter to him. Why? God was with him. He knew. So God's signs. Everybody's always looking for a sign. What does the future bring? You got it in your hand. It's all there. It will make you successful. It will cause you to overcome. In closing, open your Bibles with me to the 8th chapter of the great book of Isaiah. The prophet. And I consider to be one of the major prophets, not because it's the longest, but because it's in the middle of the Bible and easy to find. <laughs> I jest. But most Bibles, if you just hold it and split it 50-50, you're right in there. We're going to start here with chapter 8. I mean, things are going bad and Israel's messing up. You'll notice the word Emmanuel in verse 8. You know what that means. That's God with us. But um, people were taking counsel from this person and that person and just from wherever, right out of the garbage heap, okay? And God gives some very good advice, and He's going to tell you here what His signs are. And if you want to please God, and if you want His blessings, you'll pay attention to Him. Because there are many signs, and many people walk right over one and never recognize it. Okay, verse 11 of chapter 8, the great book of Isaiah. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, verse 12, Say ye not a confederacy. This has to do with the one world system. That's what a confederacy is, prophetically speaking. To all them to whom this people shall say, a confederacy, neither Fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. God doesn't want you to be afraid. Do you know why? When you're afraid, you can't operate properly. You make bad decisions when you're afraid. You can't step out there and take advantage of the good things while they're available. You just can't operate in fear. All right? 13. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your Fear. Let God be your, if you're going to fear anybody, fear Him, but reverence Him. And let Him be your dread. Dread not having Him with you. Many people think, well, God's going to zap somebody. No, that's not what it's saying. It's just the opposite. 
you better fear you don't have his protection in this world, especially this generation. Verse 14, and he shall be for a sanctuary. That is so important. Do you know what a sanctuary is? It's a place of safety. Even in this troubled world, oh, I'm afraid. I just wish I had a place I could rest a minute. I just wish I could get away from it. He shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Why would, would Messiah, and of course this has to do with Messiah, Emmanuel, back in that eighth verse, because many people that believe and call themselves Christians, their Christianity will be their stumbling block because they're going to worship the wrong Christ. It's that simple. It can be a stumbling block. You need to study the difference. Christ stipulated in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 through Paul, there is no way I'm coming back to this earth to gather anybody, snatch them out of here or anything else until the false Christ stands in Jerusalem claiming to be Jesus, claiming to be God. That ain't going to happen. He made that clear and just really broke it down. But do you need a sanctuary? Do you realize that you can be in one of the crowdest, crowdedest, a very crowded room full of people, all right? And you can slip away in the sanctuary of your mind in Him and ask a refreshing protection and just rest there a moment? You can do that. It's a thing of the Spirit. And I'm not teaching you that you should be a spiritualist. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm saying God is your sanctuary. You're not going to find any peace of mind or rest other than through Him. All right, verse uh, 15. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared, and be taken. A lot of people are going to be deceived when the whole world wanders after instead of Jesus, thinking He is Jesus. Save my daughter, Jesus. She says you're not the one. Go out and help her, will you? She's really a good girl. But she just thinks you're not the one, and thus it is written, Mother shall betray the daughter up to death, and Satan is death. Not a physical death necessarily, but he'll cause the death of your soul. 16. Bind up the testimony. Listen to these instructions. Bind. How do you bind? You sum it up. You put it in your mind. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. What are his disciples? What does this word disciple mean? Our word uh, discipline comes from it. It means to to be a student and discipline yourself in His way so that you know what to do to be blessed, to be successful, to make all that, as some people would say, bad luck go away from you, all right? Bind up. That's an instruction. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law. That's Moses. 17. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Do you look for him? Do you know where to find him? You're not going to have any sanctuary unless you do. He just told you. He just told you in the testimony and in the law. Moses and the prophets, naturally the Holy Spirit. But you must have knowledge and Cultivate your earthly um, habitat and that your spirit dwells within before you can grow. Verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs. Underline it in your mind. Are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. 
In the Hebrew, this says, which will dwell in Mount Zion. That's his favorite spot in the world. And as it is, as it is documented in the 16th chapter of Ezekiel, he married the place. Claimed it forever. That's where the center of heaven will be. But there's going to be a lot of cleaning going on before that takes place. I, that is your father, and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs. Well, that is to say Isaiah and the chi all the children. Everybody is God's child. Ezekiel was given. You're given. I'm not comparing you to Ezekiel, and I don't want anyone to get the big head. But when you become skilled in the exercise of the Holy Spirit and the Word and gain that knowledge, and the Spirit will help you, but you, he, he hates lazy people. God's made that clear. I don't like lazy people. What good are you if you're lazy? Well, I don't know. Which would you rather have help you do something? Somebody that's so lazy you have to prod them to get them up or some vivacious creature that is a workaholic, you know? Naturally, you know who you want to help you. Well, God's the same way. He's, you're natural. He's supernatural. He's more so that way. The word is sottish. He does not like sottish people. Well, does he hate them? He loves all people, but he doesn't want their help. And that's just, you know, having it up here, and he's got it. My children that are given are signs. You look at their lives. How simple could it be? It's like you, an adult, taking blocks and say, Look, child, this is the way it happened here, and that's the way it's going to happen at the end. You see this battle in Jerusalem? That's the way it was then, and the exact identical thing is going to happen at the end. That's a sign. When you see those current events beginning to align with that pattern, ding dong, the light comes on. Ooh, I see a sign. And many might people, well, there hasn't been a sign in this generation. And we've had a full eclipse and the moon turned blood red every, th every six months for the last uh, one, two, three. 3rd in March and the 4th in September. What's going on? Well, he gave the moon and the stars for signs along with his people. But his people have got to have their head out of the sand enough to say, he's talking to us. He wants our attention and get the traces, the tugs hooked up and start pulling. Uh, that means like you would hook a horse to a wagon or a plow and, um, and get to work. That's the way you do it, okay? But they are for signs and for wonders because there are people that will do wonders in this end generation. Let me rephrase. God will use people to perform wonders. It is always our Father that accomplishes it. Many people will say, you are a fantastic teacher. All I do is read this Bible. And being um, a bit of a linguist in the languages is to pull out the parts that God gives unction. It's the Word that's powerful. It's the Word that's good. So make sure that you're in it, because when you're in the Word, then you're good, all right? That's just the way it is, because the Word is powerful. God uses common people. Verse 19, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto, seek unto them that have familiar spirits, familiar spirits and evil spirits. And unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? Should not you speak to him, ask of him with understanding? Do you need wizards or do you need your father? For the living, uh, seek 
seek unto their God for the living to the dead. That means spiritually. Be spiritually alive. Verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. That's Moses and the prophets again. If they speak not according to this word. Do you want some good advice, my friend? That's what this has been about. Listen to it. To the law and to the testimony, colon. If they speak not according to this word. It is because there is no light in them. And if there is no light, there is no truth. That's not difficult, my friend. Well, how do I know the difference? This little book says Holy Bible on the front of it, all right? Holy Bible. It doesn't say Playboy, Playgirl, or... or, um, or who committed this mystery or that mystery or how to be saved. It doesn't say that on the cover. By how to be saved by Billy Bob. Okay. Doesn't say that. This says Holy Bible and it tells you how to be saved by the Savior. The Lord God Almighty through the Son. Billy Bob may not hurt you, but Billy Bob ain't God. All right? He may even peep a little bit. And he may fancy himself as a bit of wi a wizard, especially if he gets on an ego trip. That's something you want to be very careful of. Is man or woman on an ego trip? Religion seems to have a strange way of doing that. <gasps> I'm special. I'm special because... I opened my window shade the other night and a shadow fell from here, the moonshine from there to there, and it gave off light. I'm special. Well, you know, I don't care who it is, if you open a window and the moon are shining out there and it comes through and makes a light, it's just normal. That's natural, all right? It doesn't make that person special. <gasps> But God, and listen, I'm not ta I know God speaks to all of us. Please do not misread what I'm saying. But it's not to be advertised or to be made into a religion. God gives His people what they need for themselves, and it should be kept private to protect your credibility, unless He tells you otherwise. All right? Otherwise, if you're not careful, People will make a peeper, a squeaker, or something else out of you. Oh, you are special. God touched you. Let me touch you. Oh, oh. So spiritual. I'm telling you, friend, if it isn't of this word, I'm sorry. It's probably not much good. This word. God's Word is probably, I've worked in it for almost 50 years or probably more. I wish I could say that I'd learned all it had to teach. I haven't. I'm just getting started. We're right where He wants us. So if you make pretty well, you know, make this your main study book instead of listening to people, you'll probably be a lot better off. Why? Because God gave the children, you and these, as signs so that you know when you hear a peeper. And that's important. Signs are not that hard to find. They're all around you in this word. And it's so simple. This word means this. It means this word and no other word. If it differs with this word, you know it's out in left field. And don't ever let anybody feed you that. That's another gospel from somebody else, probably Billy Bob. Billy Bob's probably a pretty good old boy. I don't know why I chose that name, but I knew a boy one time named Billy Bob, and he wouldn't care. He'd probably agree with me, but be that as it may. 
Beloved, important. This is the word. You don't need anything but it. You could take, you could take the book of Isaiah and you wouldn't need any of the rest of the Bible because it for, if, if that's all you could have in your possession and it foretells and prophesies and tells of the coming of Messiah and exactly what he will do, of the Antichrist and what he will do. The prophecy is complete. Almost every prophet is that way to repeat, repeat, repeat God's plan so that the simple-minded could finally say, Ooh, I think I see that. He doesn't play tricks on you. Concentrate on His Word. And if anyone brings anything to you other or that is not according to this Word, you better be careful. Verse 21. And they shall pass through it hardly be stead. Do you know what that means? If, if you listen to that, you're going to pass through it, hardly be stead. That means you're going to be a hard case. You know what a hard case is? That means you're going to have some tough plowing, briars all the way. You're making your life miserable and tough to accomplish anything. And hungry. What, keeps, what feeds you? God's Word. Spiritually, you're going to be starved to death. If you go anywhere but God's Word, and it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king. My social security check didn't get in. <sighs> and their God, God never hears my prayers. And look upward. Oh, as good a person as I am. Why is my social security? You know, I say, hey. If they can't send that sucker to you on time, when it gets here, you refuse it. <laughs> you know, I used to, when I was with the postal department, I used to say that. And you know what? That ended the complaining. Just like that. Just woom. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with Social Security. I happen to be in that class that draws it. <laughs> all right? Nothing wrong with it at all. But what I'm saying is, don't ever depend on it. Man, if that's all you got going for you, and I'm not talking finances here. I'm saying if all your security is tied up in Social Security, you're hungry. You're hungry for some real wealth. That is to say God's Word, His security, His sanctuary, His protection, His power, and His blessings. It's there if you'll just reach out and take it. So, What have I said? What, what, what did I want to get across? Is that God is in control. Our Father wants you to trust Him. If He can take care of a little old baby. I mean, it was all hanging on that baby. There it was. He wasn't worried. If He can take care of that little baby, He can take care of you. He wants to take care of you. It makes His day. When you say, Father, I love you. Can you help me take the right path decision in my life at this point? Or just a blessing because I love you so much. There's not all that many people from the heart talking to Him. And He gets lonesome. You got a lot of peepers, a lot of squeakers. But people that earnestly get in that word and let it speak rather than uh, some fluff ball running off as a, like a, what were these old organs that they had the billows like uh, windbags, all right? Billows. And I'm, not, I'm trying to use uh, various objects so I don't call people names, you know. But really... If you're talking about self, and ah, oh, you should have known my ain't Gertie. You talk about a woman of God, ain't Gertie. Let me tell you what ain't Gertie taught. Ain't Gertie always said. Now, hey, family, that's great. I had, I happened to have an aunt Gertie used to, and she was a wonderful person, and uh, she had about eight or nine kids and. They were all named by initials. OK, LJ, 
Puke, and the youngest one was named Poopy. Now why? I think I've told you all that once, but I forgot we're on television. But if Poopy's listening, woo. Anyway, <laughs> it's wonderful to have family, but they did not write the Word of God. And you need to get it from the horse's mouth, which is to say you need to get it from the Word itself. Then will God take care of your basket when it drifts through the river and when the crocodiles are reaching for you. You're as safe and as snug as a bug in a rug. All right? You just got it made because He loves you. When your spirit and His spirit, the Holy Spirit, dwell together. And that's one of the things He said, I want to live there. And He's going to abide. That's what a, that's what a mansion is. It's, it's a resting place. That's what it is in the Greek. It's called, pronounced, moni. And me no is abide. That's the same mansion. When He abides with you, in a sense, you have your mansion today. Sanctuary, protection. So, the next time you get to feeling all alone, think of Elijah. Next time, again, that the crocs are after you, get on their case. Grow strong where you know how to deal with crocs. All right? You all know what a croc is. All right? When somebody starts trying to put a crock off on you, take care of it in short fashion, all right? How do you do that? You do it with God's Word, the weapon He gives you. It's a huge sword, and it's dangerous. It's sharp. It's two-edged. It cuts both ways. What is it? It's the Word of God. Use it. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for the privilege of allowing us to study Your Word to stay in your word, Father. Release that knowledge to us and those signs and wonders, Father, that we keep up in these, this generation where so many things are coming to pass. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our introductory offer includes the Mark of the Beast audio tape, a newsletter with a written Bible study, a complete audio tape catalog, and a list of reference materials available through Shepherd's Chapel. You may request our free introductory offer by telephone. You may also request by writing, Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. We invite you to join us and serious Bible students around the world for our next in-depth Bible study Monday through Friday at the same time. Thank you for watching and God bless you.